Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Um, fascinating talk, the previous speaker. Thank you. Um, so my name is Tim Spedding. I'm the program leader for the Australian, uh, at the Australian Antarctic, Antarctic Division for the Environmental Stewardship Program. Um, and I have the pleasure today to present on a joint so science collaboration um, that's focused on the remediation of fuel spills uh, at Argentinian and Australian stations. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Patricia for leading the submission of this presentation and for its inclusion in the symposium today. Um, I think collectively we acknowledge the importance of international collaborative approach to conducting science and sharing innovations and experiences um, in areas of contaminant cleanup and environmental remediation. There are many stations across Antarctica where contaminated sites are present from both historic and contemporary fuel spill events. Both the Argentinian and the Australian programs have dedicated science programs that focus on finding solutions for managing and remediating these fuel spills. Important, importantly to us, these are very applied science programs. They are programs that bring together lab-scale studies, pilot-scale studies, and then implement the full-scale remediation of these sites for that real-world impact. So first of all, why is this important? Many of you might have seen an image like this, but this image basically shows Antarctica's, Antarctica's ice-free areas, and these make up less than 0.5% of the continent. These areas also form the biodiversity hotspots that support the vast majority of life on the continent. Now the gray circles, these are the sites of permanent infrastructure and these are the areas that obviously have a higher risk of contamination. And as you can see, these two areas overlap. So the majority of this infrastructure is built within these important and ecologically diverse areas. You can also see from Casey Station and Carlini that these stations represent diverse geographic areas of the continent. So when you consider environmental remediation and environmental cleanup, it's important that we develop remediation approaches that are applicable to the local environment taking into account the, the particular logis logistical um, considerations, but also that these techniques are as broadly applicable and relevant across Antarctica as a whole. So through this collaboration, Australia and Argentina have taken the opportunity to compare and share our approaches on how we evaluate environmental risk and how we apply remediation strategies for fuel spill contaminated sites. But first of all, what is bioremediation? So most of you are probably aware, but bioremediation is effectively just simply stimulating the native soil microorganisms to do the work for us. For fuel spills, some of these microorganisms effectively use that soil as a food source. And in doing so, it remediates that soil. So at the simplest level, all we need to do is manage the soil conditions to make those microorganisms as active as possible. So through adjusting the soil conditions, moisture, temperature, nutrients, etc., we thereby decrease the overall concentration of fuel in the soil. And importantly, there's a growing body of scientific evidence that demonstrates the effectiveness of bioremediation in polar regions. So what does bioremediation look like in Antarctica? On the left, we have some pictures of that fuel-contaminated soil being taken out of the ground, both at Carlini Station and at Casey Station, so that those soil conditions can be adjusted and those microorganisms can be as active as possible. The image on the right is an actual image of those fuel-munching microbes from the Casey Fuel Spill Remediation Program. 
So I'll just take a few minutes just to compare and contrast a few of the aspects of the bioremediation programs um, between Casey Station and Carlini. The first thing is that not all fuel is the same, right? As we like to say, oils ain't oils. So fuels are complex mix mixtures that contain thousands of compounds, and depending on what those compounds are, that's going to influence your environmental risk, right? It's going to influence how you target the chemicals of priority and how you monitor your mediation effort. So what you can see on the left, this is the analysis of two types of diesel fuel used in the Australian program and the Argentinian program. Now don't worry about the detail, but what we're most interested in are these blue vertical lines and the shape of this red curve. Those blue vertical lines basically represent different components within that soil. And the, this red line, the further you move to the right, means the increasing complexity of those components. So those are really, really important factors to know when you look at bioremediation of a contaminated site. Because it's the mixture of those components that you see there that will determine the toxicity. Different components have different toxicity. It determines their mobility. Different components will mobile, be mobile or less mobile in the Antarctic environment. And it's those mixtures of these comp components that influence how those fuel munching microbes degrade that fuel and how fast and also what the degradation byproducts may be. And I'll also just add that we are interested in developing a chemical library of fuels used across Antarctica. Um, so this is to better inform our understanding of environmental risk. Uh, so if there's anyone who's interested in sharing fuel samples with us, um, please let me know. Now I think we'll all be aware that the climate and the environmental conditions between Carlini and Casey are really quite different the temperature, the snow cover, the precipitation, the geology, etc. But these site conditions have obvious implications to how a contaminant will behave and interact with the Antarctic environment. It affects the environmental risk and also your remediation performance. So in this case, at Casey Station, we have maximum soil temperatures of about 2 degrees Celsius. While at Carlini, we have maximum soil temperatures of around seven or eight degrees. This is a big difference for those fuel munching microbes, right? and therefore has a big influence on the efficiency of your remediation. But these conditions also inform our decision making about whether you can re conduct that remediation in the ground, or if you need to remove the soil to conduct your remediation above ground. And it's also really important to know how you optimize your bioremediation. And this graph just shows how simple operational measures can make a big difference. So here's an example of data from Casey Station. And effectively, all it's showing is that we have less than 50 days where soil is above zero degrees Celsius and we'll have active bioremediation. But simple operational activities, such as removing snow 10 or 15 days earlier, will extend your bioremediation window throughout a season by 20 or 25 percent. Now we all are heavily invested and work in the Antarctic, so we all know that there are a lot of operational and logistical challenges and constraints when working in the Antarctic. Um, and these obviously will have an influence on how you develop and you design your remediation. And this is because bioremediation of fuel contaminated soil is not just about managing a pile of contaminated soil. Right? It's about developing systems and a suite of Antarctic relevant solutions to undertake that remediation activity. So here are just some examples. This includes understanding and designing containment areas to, as, to contain that soil while it's undergoing remediation. An example from Carlini Station, looking at passive 
um, warming of the soil to increase the remediation, as well as containerized water treatment systems to manage leachate um, as part of the remediation process. So collectively, it's these systems that all need to be designed within the overall operational context of an Antarctic station. And here's an example from a full-scale remediation program at Casey Station. Just wanted to note that it's the size, the length, the orientation, the location of all of these piles all take into account the operational and the logistical constraints while trying to maximize that remediation efficiency. And I'll add that both Argentina, Argentina and Australia continue to conduct field trials to improve the overall remediation efficacy in ways that are cost effective, robust, reliable, and where possible, low maintenance. The result, collaboratively, we've demonstrated that bioremediation bio works on the field scale in the Antarctic, and then there was a reduction of contaminants and the overall environmental risk across different sites in Antarctica. These graphs show that decrease in fuel concentrations during bioremediation at both Carlini and Casey. But it is important to note the time frames. So lastly, what are the benefits of international multidisciplinary collaboration? So first of all, concurrent programs accelerate the learning and progress. And they're an opportunity for us to collectively test and prove the practicality and robustness of different approaches. International programs and collaboration provides access to experienced personnel that can form multinational field teams for a campaign approach to remediation science and the full-scale cleanup activities. And most of you may be aware of the Antarctic Cleanup Manual. This is an important committee for environmental protection resource that provides guidance to Antarctic treaty parties in order to address environmental risks posed by contaminated sites. The Cleanup Manual is updated regularly by the CEP as new science and practical guidance becomes available. So international collaboration means collective contribution to the cleanup manual and the CEP in a way that is relevant and useful to all parties and considers the reality of diverse contaminated sites in Antarctica. So where to next? There are a range of contaminated sites across Antarctica and the sub-Antarctic. And so many countries are dealing with these issues. Australia and Argentina intend to continue our scientific collaboration on fuel spill remediation and environmental risk assessments. We'll seek opportunity to tackle other contaminated sites using what we have learned. This includes developing tools for evaluating risk, decision making on prioritization, remediating sites, and monitoring the restoration of these sites. And we are looking for opportunities to collaborate with other national Antarctic programs dealing with similar cleanup issues. And that thereby increases the benefits and the application of this science towards the protection of the environment across Antarctica. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, there is any question for him? Is it enough? Thank you. So, not the case. I would uh, um, think that, Michelle, you are moving your hand. There is a question. But also there is a comment online uh, to Gen uh, for his presentation on what uh, NIPR is doing at Showa Station. 
and the comment was simply to congratulate you on that work, and IPR on that work, and to say that that will um, add to energy efficiencies at your base and also add to environmental protection. So that was the comment to be relayed to you again. And then the question for uh, Patricia and Tim, uh, Tim, uh, well, first of all, comment that this is an excellent example of international collaboration beyond science facilitation. So we always talk about collaboration related to science. This is an amazing collaboration to um, clean up sites of past activity. So congratulations on that. In the most recent CEP meeting, Comnap's advice to that meeting was to review the cleanup manual because of the changes we're seeing in the Antarctic related to climate change. And so I'm just wondering if you've had any thoughts about how many sites of past activities may be impacted by climate change and what remediation or cleanup should be related to those. Uh, that's a good question and a, and a complicated one. So uh, I know that there were a number of people who attend the CEP um, and who attended just a few weeks ago. I mean. Um, so my understanding of the cleanup manual is, is that it is regularly reviewed and, and updated as new information becomes available. And I know the CEP will have a, a review schedule um, for, the, for the manual. Um, and I think, hopefully not speaking out of turn here, I know that you know, prioritizing sites based on potential changes, environmental risk based on changing climate and clean is, is absolutely um, something that's considered within um, within that work. 